welcome to the Q&A video. I'm kind of just doing this as an opportunity for people to get to know me a little bit better because posting YouTube videos like isn't very interactive. We can't have a conversation. You're just you're just such a good listener, always listening to me, and that's so sweet of you. I don't feel the need to do a long intro for this one. This video is pretty self-explanatory. Also, before I forget, disappointing news to anyone that like actually likes my channel, in which case you're the best. Thank you. I, at least for now, I'm gonna switch to doing videos every other week instead of every week, only because I can't keep up with every week. Like, that's a lot. <laughs> There might be some like bonus episodes here and there. I might say this and then end up releasing videos every week anyways, but I just want it out there. And I've got my handy little iPad here with all the questions on it because I don't have them memorized. I was gonna write them down and put them in a cute journal so I can have like a cute little aesthetic like thing that I'm reading from, but it's, um, it's currently the Saturday before this video is gonna be released. So I have 20 hours to finish and edit this because my little sister visited last week and that was really fun. But it does mean that I had no time to film or edit anything. Also, I've decided not to include the names of people that submitted questions only because not everybody wants their name on the internet and I wanna protect people's privacy. Also, these are in no particular order. I need to set this down. I can't just hold this like Hamlet. Come on, saw, turn the key and cool her off. Well, if that isn't relatable, I don't know what is. So you know on Ravelry how you can have a project queue, like a proper queue? I don't have something like that. I don't have like projects lined up that I'm gonna do next. On Ravelry, the only feature that I use right now is favorites. And so everything, every pattern I wanna do is just stored in favorites and nowhere else. And then I also save like inspiration images on Pinterest or Instagram. And so I just have these big, pools of inspiration and there's no way in my lifetime that I could ever knit and crochet all the things I want to knit and crochet. So I don't really treat them as like a list of projects that I have to do. It's more so a pool of opportunity that I can pick from when I feel like it. I'm gonna treat that like three questions. So my favorite book is actually The Hunger Games because it was the first book that I ever enjoyed reading. I hated reading as a kid. It was not my thing. And I didn't realize until much later that it was because I was not being exposed to books that I would enjoy reading. And it makes sense because my favorite genre to read for like entertainment purposes is usually thrillers. It makes sense why adults would not have recommended scary books to me, but I think that's what I needed. A book that brought me a lot of joy is like hardly even a book. It's called My Cat is More Impressive Than Your Baby. You can make whatever assumptions about me you want based on that book. And then, okay, and then a book that changed my perspective about something. Some people are going to roll their eyes so hard. It's a book called Ishmael by Daniel Quinn. It's kind of about the philosophy of environmentalism while still being a fiction book. And I read it in high school because it was required reading at my high school, but it did change my perspective on how I view what do we owe the planet and why. And the book's not perfect, but it did change my perspective about something. And I appreciate that. And I have reread it several times since. So I like that. Getting drunk from seven to three. All her adoption, flesh like it's free. So that one's pretty easy. I communicate a lot to friends and family via Snapchat. And so I would send these long like videos of me talking to friends and family members. <laughs> and for some reason, I was constantly talking about my projects that I was working on. And it got to a point where I was just sending individuals like 10 to 20 minutes worth of snaps every day, which is like too much to be sending to people. It wasn't that big of a leap to move from sending like snap videos like this to doing a little bit of editing and posting it online, or at least that was my thought. It's <laughs> making YouTube videos is definitely, it's more work in areas I didn't expect and it's less work in areas that I didn't expect. So yeah, I just, I wanted someone to talk to about all my crafts. So when I started knitting socks, I started with doing German short rows and I do not like doing German short rows or short rows in general. 
it just requires too much focus on my part. And for some reason, I know some people feel the total opposite, but heel flap and gusset is a lot more mindless for me. So the first time I tried a heel flap and gusset, I loved it. I love the fit. I love the process. I love how it looks. So that is my favorite as of right now. Okay. And then favorite needle size. That is really tough to answer because I have like a set of knitting needles and I use them all a lot. I would have such a hard time if someone was like, pick a pair of needle sizes to get rid of. I don't know what I would pick. <sighs> I think if I had to pick a favorite, it would probably be a four millimeter. And I think that's pretty common. I think it's the most comfortable to work with. Girl, I know where those paws have been today. I don't want them touching me until I get a chance to clean your paws. <laughs> okay, and thanks to the people that were like, this isn't a question. I just wanted to tell you that I enjoy your videos. Thank you. You tell me you're scared. You tell me you're weak. I don't even have to think about it. It would be the Halibut Sweater by Caitlin Hunter. It was a fun process. It fits beautifully. It looks cool. It looks so cool. I bought yarn to make another one. I love it. Favorite project you've made so far in the year and in your life? In my life? Okay, for knitting, it's got to be the first sweater I ever made. If only because that was the spark that got me to be like, oh my gosh, I can do this. I can actually do this. I can make anything. And it just, my brain flipped from being like, I could never do this to being like, I can do all of it. And now I'm delusional where I'm like, I could do anything. I can't, but I think I can. And that's important. Confidence. You don't have to earn your confidence in knitting and crochet. I feel like just having it is half the battle. Because if you think you can do something, you're way more likely to be able to do it. And then favorite project of all time for crochet is definitely the rug in my living room, only because I interact with it every single day and it makes me happy and it's so soft and I get to make memories with it and it's aging really well. I was worried that it wasn't gonna like age super great and it was gonna look like gross and old really quickly, but looking at it now, I think it's just going to look worn, but in a good way. I'm okay with worn. Like this chair is very worn. Okay. And then in the year for crochet, it's okay. I'll just tell you where my brain is so I can stop thinking about it. It's a cross between the crochet bandana that I made and the like crochet market bag thing that I made because, because the bandana was a game changer and now I am a bandana person. Um, I had only tried wearing like silk ones before and they slip off constantly, even when I put in a ton of bobby pins, but the crochet or knit ones made of yarn, like stay on so well. So I'm going to be making more. And then it's also a game changer, like hair wise. If I'm having a bad hair day, you just put on a bandana. And then the market bag is just something that I spent a lot of time on and I'm, I'm really happy with how it turned out. Not gonna lie, I am looking forward to my hair growing out because right now it can't really all go in a hair tie. That's why I have I have this because it can't all fit up there. Some people are way too opinionated. I get where it's coming from, but also it's annoying. I'm so sorry. You asked for the most controversial take and here it is. There is so much pressure. Anytime someone joins the knitting or crochet community, there's so much pressure because of all these opinions about what designers you should and should not be knitting from, what yarn you should and should not be using, how many projects you should be creating. Some people pump out like a sweater every week and everyone like pounces on them for like, you need to slow down. That's way too much. You're overworking, whatever. And then some people feel bad because they only can do like one project a year or they never finish any projects. And who cares if all someone wants to make is petite knit. And my opinion is that as long as it's not actively hurting somebody, you should engage with this hobby however you want, whatever makes it more fun for you, because it's a hobby. And I can't imagine having the audacity to tell someone how they can and cannot enjoy their hobby. Again, when it's not hurting anybody, you can display your values and you can talk about your values and how much they mean to you, but you can't shame other people for maybe not meeting your values where they are. 
Like there's just too much anger and shame. And I know it's probably just like 5%, like 95% of the people in the knitting and crochet fiber arts community are super loving and supportive and just want people to be a part of the craft. And then there's 5% that's just missing compassion and empathy and love. And unfortunately, they tend to be the loudest percentage, at least on social media. That is so easy. I don't even have to think about it. I would want to be a full-time fiber artist. I would love to be the kind of person that spends a year on a dress for the Met Gala and designing it. And I would love to collaborate with other craftsmen in their field. I would love for part of my job to be learning new skills and crafts and being able to do new things um, and perfect the skills I already have. I would love to become a master at knitting. That is definitely a lifetime goal of mine. I would like to get to the point where I can consider myself like a master of this craft. Favorite yarn and pattern. So my favorite, so my favorite yarn type is cashmere because I'm a bougie girl at heart. And then my favorite specific yarn is hedgehog fiber sock yarn. I made a pair of socks using that yarn like a year ago and I wear them at least twice a week with shoes. And I love these socks. They've held up so well. They've worn so well. They still look new. And so I think the cost is absolutely worth the result. And then my favorite pattern to use that yarn with is Kudavakika Smart Heart Socks. It's just a two by two rib heel flap gusset sock pattern. I think it's just a classic sock pattern that goes with everything. And that is my absolute go-to sock pattern. <laughs> It was 2020 and my husband and I, before we got married, decided that we wanted to get a cat and all of the cats in our county in a reasonable driving distance of like within 40 minutes of driving were all adopted. The shelters were wiped clean of cats because everybody was adopting cats during COVID and dogs. I believe the Humane Society had sent over two cats to the local pet store, or at least that's what they told us. And they were just two stragglers left over from a litter. One of those cats was Pippin and I was holding her and the lady that I was talking to was like, oh, she's the quiet one. And I was like, perfect, I'll take her. And then nine months later, I had graduated college, gotten married, moved across the country. And it was shortly after my husband and I moved to our current place in Oregon, where he decided that he wanted to have another cat because Pippin had lived with me up until then. And she was very much so like my cat. Uh, she's a Velcro cat and he wanted a cat. He wanted a cat to like be his cat. You know, if you have cats, you know. Within 24 hours, we met up with a stranger in a parking lot at night and they handed us a cat and we handed them some money and that's how we got married. They are besties, they are roommates, they are roommates sometimes. So yeah, they have a very interesting dynamic that changes constantly. Sometimes their relationship is more caretaking for one another, be very protective of one another, but they also like fight with each other. Um, I've seen in your videos that sometimes you use two different size needles on your circulars. Why? I'm new to knitting and want all the cool tricks to create amazing things. Wow, could I have read that any dorkier? Let me try. I've seen your videos that sometimes use two different needle sizes. Yes, I almost always use two different size needles on my circulars. I have interchangeable needles, which means the heads can be like screwed off and screwed back on. It's because when I'm working back and forth, my purl stitches are a lot looser than my knit stitches. So if I want it to look like a very even fabric, I will use a smaller needle for the purl side and a larger needle for the knit side. And then if I'm knitting in the round, I will still use a smaller needle size on my left hand needle. It just makes the stitches glide off and I can just knit so much faster and more smoothly. <laughs> Did poop and poop in the tub? No, no, that was in reference to a specific video. She did not poop in the tub that time, but she constantly poops in the tub. And I know why. It's not her fault, but it's kind of annoying. I don't know. I think I, I respect 
good pattern designers enough to know that it is a skill that requires a lot of practice. And if I were to design a pattern, I would want it to be well-written. I would want it to be tech edited. And that stuff requires time and money and knowledge and experience, not all of which I have. And so I think it depends. If there was something that I was really excited about, then maybe. I would also have a hard time releasing a pattern for like a vanilla sweater because that's been done. Do we really need me to release another vanilla sweater pattern? It would have to be because I came up with something so interesting or creative, at least to me. Where did I live pre-Washington? So I do not live in Washington. I actually live in Oregon, but I know I've generically said the Pacific Northwest before. But before I lived here, I have lived in Ohio, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. What was the long distance relationship you and your now hubby had? This was the first time I had lived in Oregon for an internship and my now husband was living in Georgia and we were unable to communicate via phone for several months of this. So the only way we could communicate was through handwritten letters, which is an interesting task. <laughs> Something about letter writing just made us way more dramatic. And I love that I kept all the letters there in a nice chunky box because there are lots of them. It's going to be so fun to look back on those letters in like 20 years. And we were long distance for like seven months. I can't really remember. It was somewhere between six and eight months. So we were long distance for like seven months and then we were living in the same state for like two months and then COVID hit and he got kicked out of the dorms in school. We all did. And I happened to have had a friend that lived in our college town and I ended up living with them. And then my husband had to go back to another state at home. So we were long distance yet again. That was not fun, but boy, does it just Long distance is not fun. Anyone who has done it knows. It makes you crazy. When thinking about sustainability and overconsumption, how do you balance making slash knitting something you know that you will use or wear versus making something just for the skill, building slash love of the craft slash process? I don't really have to balance it so much, mainly because I can't make things that quickly that it becomes, in my mind, an overconsumption problem. I know everyone has their line set in a different place of what to them is overconsumption, but for me, knitting and crochet, if I'm making it by hand in a slow process, I'm not even going to consider that as overconsumption in my brain. It's my hobby. It's how I keep the mental demons away. And it just it brings me so much creative joy. I feel like it's, it's more my purpose than anything else. And so I'm just, I'm unwilling to give up on those because they have far too much meaning in my life. But that being said, there are things that I really want to make just for the process of them that I know I will never use. And there are things that I have made knowing I would never use the thing, um, specifically because I wanted to make it. And an example that comes to mind is a crochet mushroom purse that I had made because my mom sent me a picture of a crochet mushroom purse and said it was really cute. And I treated it as an opportunity to practice improvised structural crochet. I wore it once because I had made it and I figured I should probably wear it once, but I ended up giving it to a friend who loves it. Um, and then this person goes on to talk about like the guilt that comes with consuming. It's, Obviously, it's up to you to decide where's your balance, where's your line, what are you okay with, and hopefully not letting other people have too much influence in that space in your mind, because other people really don't belong in that space in your mind. Here's the deal. In the grand scheme of your life, with all the things that you consume, consider having like a pie chart that represents your entire like carbon footprint or your sustainable impact. Is knitting and crochet going to be that big of a section? Do you need to really hate on yourself? Because if it's only like 2% of your entire carbon footprint is coming from your knitting and crochet hobby, then maybe don't worry about it so much. But for me, there are other areas in my life where I am more sustainable. My husband and I, we both work from home. We don't really drive anywhere. That really reduces your carbon footprint when you don't have to travel anywhere every single day. And when we do drive somewhere, we take my very old hybrid Prius, which gets like 50 miles to the gallon, even though it's over 20 years old. I don't turn on the heat in the winter. I don't plan on having kids. That's additional humans that are not being introduced to the world that will also have a carbon footprint. There are just there are things I do that have a much bigger impact than I think my yarn and knitting and crochet consumption. 
Um, I think this is especially true because I'm not buying new tools all the time. Like I have everything I'll need. It's so up to the individual to decide what they're okay with. And I won't buy more knitting and crochet, like paraphernalia, um, unless mine becomes damaged or doesn't work for what I need it for, which is hardly ever the case. So I'm set on, and for yarn, I don't use, and then as far as yarn consumption, I never have more yarn that I could reasonably use in a year. And that's the line for me. I know some people are like, no, it has to be yarn that I can use within three months. And for some people it's like, nope, I have enough yarn to last me a lifetime. So it's up to you to decide how much you want to have. Cause that's the biggest consuming factor. I think in knitting and crochet is like your yarn consumption. And if you're really feeling that guilty about it, then if you have the opportunity to buy secondhand yarn, buy more sustainable yarn, invest in that. If it's really going to make you feel that much better to do those things. And if it's really important to you, then, yeah, absolutely. Let's do that. Um, I was at the thrift store yesterday and I found two cashmere sweaters. I was very excited. So there are, there are options. It's hard. Yeah, I know it's rough. Is there a type of project that you were more excited slash inspired to make? Anytime there's a project that involves me acquiring a new skill, that's when I get the most excited. And I also get really excited for projects when I'm designing something myself and not just following another pattern, like exciting and terrifying kind of go hand in hand in this area where anytime I'm like really excited for a project, I'm also a little bit terrified about it, that it's not going to turn out good, which I think is part of the excitement. What kinds of projects do you find the process and finished object the most satisfying? Anytime I work on a project that I spend a lot of time on, I always find that incredibly satisfying when it's done. I would say this is especially true if I had to like undo part of the project at some point and redo portions of it or even the whole thing. I would say the more, the more frustration and time that went into a project, the more, uh, the more satisfied I am when it's done. Okay. And then how and where do you find them? Um, the same places a lot of people do. Ravelry, great resource, YouTube, knitting and crochet community, get recommendations from there. Instagram, which I am trying not to spend as much time on lately, but I do have saved items on Instagram when I find something particularly inspiring. Do you hear her? Mary was not the quiet one in her litter. Um, so yeah, sometimes I'll have saved stuff on Instagram and then Pinterest. I have a lot of inspiration there. Um, but then there's also sources that I think are less obvious that are still very valid sources of inspiration. So like movies and TV shows, like literally, honestly, anything, if someone handed me an architecture book and said, make a sweater inspired by this book, I could make a sweater. I could definitely make a sweater inspired by an architecture book. And so could you, and it would be amazing. Let me go. I'm gonna go grab it. So I love this yarn because it reads as beige, but when you look up close and oh, gosh, I wish it could come across on camera. I wish I could just hand this to you so you could see it's got green, orange, pink, purple, blues. The whole rainbow is fully represented. It's very rustic. And so I have no idea what to make this into because I do not like the feeling of rustic things. So if anybody has any ideas for what I could do with a single hank of rustic yarn that I don't want touching my skin, <laughs> let me know. I bought this at a local farmer's market in my area. The woman who sold it, I didn't get a lot of time to talk to her because she was kind of busy talking to some other people, but she raised her own sheep, harvested the wool, dyed the wool, spun it up herself. It's definitely hand spun. And you can tell when you look at it, that it's definitely hand spun. Um, and it's just, it's really beautiful and it's really special. I made up for the loss. Took some time to think it over. 
Yes, I am an engineer. I work at a big tech company and I went to college for what I'm doing. I grew up during the big American recession. And so my more formative years were spent in a more frugal time in the United States. And so at the time when people were asking like, what do you want to be when you grow up? It was the same time I was seeing a lot of adults that I knew being unemployed and struggling to find work and people tightening the purse strings a little bit. And that really influenced what I wanted to do when I grew up because I don't have a lot of passion for engineering, but I wanted a safe job with a steady paycheck. And I am sad about the trade-off of not being able to pursue a more creative career that I'm more passionate about. But at the same time, I'm incredibly thankful for my steady paycheck. It's, it's very important to me. I'm a risk adverse person. And so I, I just need it. I'm so thankful for my job, especially because I graduated during peak COVID. And so no one was hiring. Many, many of my friends and classmates were unable to get jobs for up to a year, for some people even more after they had graduated. And these are people that had amazing resumes, great credentials, solid GPAs, and multiple internship experiences. And they were still struggling to find jobs because no one was hiring. So I am so incredibly thankful for my job and I will stay as long as they will have me. What is your decision process for choosing a project? Um, there are two things. One is just a sudden whirlwind of inspiration and a like very specific thing that I'm like, yes, I have to make this now. So that's great when that happens, but when that doesn't happen and I want to cast something on this new, but I haven't, I don't have a clear idea in my head. I will sit down on my living room floor and I will spread out all of the yarn that I own so I can see all of it. And then I will lay out all of my knitting and crochet books in front of me. I will have my iPad there with Pinterest pulled up and my phone with Instagram on it. When I have everything laid out, I'll go through all my knitting and crochet books. And if I don't find anything that matches up with yarn that I have in my stash, then I will go to Pinterest and then Instagram, Etsy even sometimes if I'm feeling real desperate. Of course, I'll go through my Ravelry favorites. And usually going through all of that and looking at thousands of patterns, <laughs> I'll find something that works with the yarn I have. It's very rare that I walk away from one of those situations like without an idea. The hardest part is usually choosing one project when there's so many that I wanna work on. What do you do with your swatches? That is easy. I either unravel them and put them into the project that I was swatching for, or I tag them and bag them. I made little cardstock tags. It's just, it's just a rectangle of paper with a hole punched in it. And I will tie that onto my swatch. And then I'll write out like, what's the name of the yarn that I use? Did I hold it single, double? What size needle did I use it for? What projects did I have in mind? What was the date that I made the swatch? And I have like maybe 10 of those right now because I usually unravel things. But I do have this idea where I like build up a massive swatch collection and then turn it into something like cute. So maybe I'll make a swatch blanket or do a little wall decor with all my swatches or something. But for now, I just hold on to them. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I was pretty stressed for a while because I was not getting enough sleep for like several months straight. There was not a single night in like a six month period where I got eight hours of sleep every night. I was just not sleeping well. And I tried everything. I tried the like quick caffeine, do melatonin, do less melatonin, do more, take these specific vitamins, make sure you exercise every day. Don't consume alcohol, reduce your sugar intake. Don't eat after a certain period of time. Like take a hot shower before bed, take a cold shower before bed. Make sure you're listening to a meditation sleep story before bed to help you fall asleep or listen to spa music, listen to guitar music or piano music, listen to white noise, have no noise, have some lights on, have no lights. I tried everything. After months of trying everything, I was like, nope, it is time for some medical intervention. So I talked to my doctor and she got me set up and I've been sleeping good for several weeks now, which is 
It's so nice. It's so necessary. And then what are your top three favorite genres of movies? Thank you for asking. Top three genres. Okay, I'm gonna get pretty specific with this. One would be feel-good drama comedies. And they're usually like pretty easy to watch and just like fill me with the most joy. Second would be gut-wrenching emotional movies that make me cry every single time I watch them. Sometimes you just need a good cry. And anytime a movie can make you cry, like the amount of emotion that you have to put into this like audio visual art form to make it so emotional that I end up crying is insane. That's, that's such a crazy cool thing that humans can do. And then third would be like 90s and early 2000s movies that make me think of my mom. She's not dead or anything. It kind of makes it sound like she is, but she's not. Um, she's alive and well, but it's a very specific genre of movies that just makes me think of her. And every time I watch them, I think of all the parts that she would laugh at and all the lines that she thinks are like the best and scenes that are her favorite. And usually they're just, they're good movies. Very nostalgic. This is such an interesting question that I think like everyone should think about because it's so fun to think about, but I am a daydreamer. I love daydreaming. So my dream project for crochet <sighs> would be making an amigurumi version of my husband and I and our cats and then making an amigurumi couch and like a little set for our little amigurumi selves to sit in. And I'm not talking like amigurumi me, I'm talking like amigurumi me. So this is the kind of project that would take a very long time for me to complete and I would wanna be good at it. I would want it to turn out good. And I would take a picture of our little like crochet selves all set up on the couch and I would have that be our Christmas card and have it all be crochet. I feel, like a, I feel like that's the kind of thing I could do with AI, but I just, I want to make it by hand. My dream project to knit is almost embarrassing. So I love the movie Knives Out. I saw it four times in theaters and I drug everyone I know to go see it in theaters. I would like to knit every single piece that could be reasonably hand knit from the movie Knives Out. And that includes Marta's sweaters and cardigans and her Oh, the beautiful, like, multicolored textural scarf that she wears. Um, and then also, obviously, the iconic Ransom um, cable knit white sweater. I would love to do that. I know other people have recreated it, and I think some people have even written patterns for that sweater. But I would personally like to do it without reading any of those patterns or seeing what other people did. And this is kind of a dream project in the sense that, to me, that would be the true test of my knitting capabilities. That would let me know that like, yes, I can do this. I can do anything. So yeah, that's definitely, that's a dream project. Wherever you're going, I'm going to. How long have we been married? Just over three years. So we've been married for just over three years. And I know the person also put down in this same comment that they think that we're about the same age. I'm in my mid twenties um, and they don't know a lot of people around our age that are married. So I actually grew up in a community where it was pretty common for people to be married pretty young. I don't know how to say this. It was never very important to me to be married. That wasn't really a goal of mine. I did and do want to be in a loving long-term relationship, but having the like badge of I'm married wasn't that important to me and I totally understand that it is very important to a lot of people and there's a lot of meaning in that and I think that's great. It was really important to my partner and it was really important to our family members that we get married if we were to enter into or continue a long-term relationship. It's not like I needed any convincing to get married. It was just one of those things where I was like, I'm kind of indifferent. So if it's important to you, yeah, let's get married. I do think that there are some benefits to it. I think the biggest benefit to being married, and it's kind of an unfortunate one, is people take your relationship a lot more seriously when you're married. I feel like people respect the title of 
husband and wife or married partner more than they respect the title of a boyfriend or girlfriend or unmarried partner, which is really sad. And I, I it, it's sad, but it's true. It doesn't take a lot of credentials to get married. You don't have to pass any tests. They just let you do it. And so there's no really, there's no badge of honor for being married. So anyways, <laughs> the point was, yes, I got married really young. I think I was 22. And so was my husband. We are the same age. Come on, sir. Turn the key and cool her off. Thank you to everyone that submitted questions. I, w I genuinely was concerned that no one would ask any questions. And so I'm glad people did. And so, yeah, I will see you in probably two weeks. I'm hungry, so I'm gonna make myself some breakfast and then I'm gonna edit this so that it can be out. You know, what time is it now? It's probably like noon. And I typically release my videos at 6 a.m. Although if I don't have it done tonight, I'm not gonna like blow my entire Saturday just like being upset. Hopefully I have this up by tomorrow. I'll just pat myself on the back if this is up on time. You tell me you're scared. You tell me you're weak. But I know you're stronger than what you think. I'm gonna take a nap now.